Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, all right, so why don't we just start with some self-introductions. Um, starting with you, Pablo, why don't you tell who you are, what you do, and uh, maybe touch upon what sort of computer vision uh, use cases have been really effective uh, in your field, and then we can go over anyone else. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. My name is Pablo Damasceno. I am a uh, principal data scientist at uh, Janssen Pharmaceuticals, part of Johnson & Johnson. And I lead a team of five data scientists that look into using computer vision for understanding videos in our clinical trials. So a lot of our clinical trials involve um, recordings of endoscopy videos, ultrasounds, uh, and what we do is use computer visions to help understand the disease severity in these uh, diseases and get this information to help guide the clinical trial. So in a sense, if a doctor, usually the way that uh, a clinical trial would run is that if you have a video before the clinical trial, a clinician would look into the video, say what's the level of the disease severity there, you have a group of people that are going to receive the drug. A doctor then will make this uh, reading again. And there are a few exciting things that computer vision can do. One of them is to enhance what the doctor is doing, uh, automate the process. If they have to read hundreds to thousands of uh, videos, we can uh, help use with, with computer vision, help uh, guide the types of readings that they are doing, and perhaps go a little bit beyond of something that perhaps a clinician could not even see in the image and give some of this information. So uh, that's where uh, computer vision for us has been uh, quite useful. Uh, good afternoon, this is uh, Pradeep here. I work for a company called Ignitarium. Uh, I manage the software division and uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, computer vision applications for the past uh, seven years and we have seen some uh, interesting applications that we got to develop for our customers across uh, different industry verticals. Uh, there's uh, industrial factory floor, uh, there is infrastructure, there is medical, uh, there's also uh, retail and automotive as well. So in our field, uh, we get to deal with a lot of uh, sensors, uh, 2D sensors, 3D sensors, and the list just keeps growing. And uh, the second significant component in the solutions that we build is the compute. Uh, the use of different types of compute, uh, right from microcontrollers to FPGAs to DSPs, uh, to the newer, uh, you know, ASICs that have a lot of compute uh, to run some of the heavier workloads. And then uh, we also focus on uh, using the latest deep learning uh, models, mostly CNNs as of now, but uh, exploring the use of uh, Gen AI as, you know, all of us should uh, look at it. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a few of the interesting use cases that, uh, you know, we have deployed for our customers. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I am Chalamai Abachu. Uh, by role, I'm a senior enterprise architect focused on advanced analytics that leverages AI and machine learning. I work for a manufacturing company, Georgia Pacific, the paper manufacturer. So we are USA's number one a manufacturer of food products, paper products, and anything you think about boxes, which are Amazon or anyone else. Uh, being a manufacturing and a legacy company, AI has transformed the way we think about manufacturing processes the computer vision especially on how do we make our things better, be it processes, be it quality, be it employees, employment safety, labor loss. So we have so many things that we go through a lot of AI and computer vision is applied maybe from past three, four years at our company. And anything about an enterprise is a scale, right? So we have around 150 plus manufacturing sites within US. So deploying a computer vision model on one site versus 150 sites, making those changes, it's a large process. So we take care of all the architecture processes within those uh, lines. And there are very interesting use cases that we'll discuss over the session. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Shubham Shrivastav. I work at uh, Ford Moore Company, where I lead a team of computer vision and machine learning engineers towards development of uh, perception systems for autonomous vehicles. One of the biggest shifts I have seen uh, in autonomous driving industry is that we are able to do so much more nowadays with just 2D sensors. So we can just take in camera data, uh, 
just from one camera or from multiple camera and we can uh, literally consume that information and make predictions about all the objects around the vehicle, uh, be it cars, vehicle, um, you know, pedestrians, motorcycles and whatnot, um, get their six degrees of freedom pose and not just that, but also make predictions about their future trajectories, which come out to be uh, really, really precise. So that's one of the things that I, I'm most excited about um, in, in autonomous driving. Uh, and while we are on the topic about <laughs> topic of exciting things, uh, why don't you all talk about you know a specific computer vision use case that has been very interesting to you in your industry? And uh, you know, perhaps go into the details of what the problem is, and even touch upon what the architecture, like to the extent that you can talk about what sort of architecture you have been using towards uh, solving some of those problems. Maybe Pablo, you can start. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, there are quite a few exciting things in the the area of using computer vision for uh, our clinical trials. Um, I think. One big shift I have seen is that we initially focused on proof of concept uh, projects where we are basically trying to automate. A doctor goes and finds the tumor and puts a box and measures how big the tumor is. Okay, this is something we have tons of training data. Let's automate this. And we're able to automate and we're able to get to the accuracy, precision of the best of the doctors. So, okay, we can save them a ton of time we can uh, automate and scale these, which is great. The next thing that we are now able to do, which is really exciting, is can we go beyond? Can we take all this data? Can we predict this patient might have a tumor growth in the next year? Um, so one recent case, uh, it's published work in collaboration with PAGE, was some of our drugs, they work better if you have a genetic mutation. But genetic tests are expensive, and if you have a cancer, say, uh, they are not necessarily going to test your, you know, your genes. And we, as a pharma company, we would never know if our drug is going to work on you or not because we don't know if you have this gene. So, wouldn't it be amazing if you were able to take something that the doctors do, could, you know, commonly do? If you have a cancer, they're going to take a, a biopsy to look at in the microscope. So this is a question we had. Can we look at this uh, image from the microscope and predict if you have this genetic mutation? It turns out that you can. And it's something that the doctors are not able to look at the image and come up with, oh, you have this genetic mutation, I can see here. It's just something that the model was able to understand, God knows, you know, using which uh, features in the image. And uh, this was with plain, you know, CNNs, nothing uh, too fancy. But what has been fancy and really exciting that we have uh, discovered was if you have many, many, you know, millions of images, if you do what's called the pre-processing or pre-training, where you don't yet know which question you're gonna ask, you just make a bunch of different variations in your images and you pre-train the model to just find features that are interesting. And this takes days, weeks in the computer, just finding interesting features. And then you take those features and you say, okay, now I'm gonna try to predict if you have this mutation. I'm gonna try to predict if you have cancer. I'm gonna try to predict your mort mortality in the next few years. Uh, it turns out that it has been working a lot more than training each of those individual questions end to end. You spend a week of compute power, and then once you have the features, you can do that in, in minutes to hours. Now I have another question, another question, another question. So I think that's what has been really exciting is going beyond what by eye a clinician could do and make uh, predictions that, that we, we thought were impossible. Cool. Uh, I, if I may, I'll take uh, two uh, use cases uh, and uh, explain the you know, uh, kind of the contrast in terms of simpler use cases first, which is uh, the infrastructure inspection work that we've been doing with customers, uh, mainly with the railroad here in the US, and also a few uh, you know, uh, analysis of uh, wind, wind turbines in Europe where we get to use uh, cameras uh, mounted on drones and also on the vehicle, the terrestrial cameras, uh, get the footage of the railway tracks and then start applying uh, models which are trained to identify defects uh, on and off the track. And uh, this is really useful for customers who are doing the maintenance. Uh, what typically takes uh, you know, a few months to manually you know, have someone 
go around tracks and check uh, uh, is being done in like uh, in a day or a few hours if you get the right kind of compute. So that is one kind of uh, use case. Uh, the challenge there that we see is uh, getting access to data and uh, identifying the right kind of sensors. Uh, sometimes you've got to go to uh, like countries like Brazil where you have to install you know uh, your hardware and get the right footage. So there are some you know logistical challenges in getting the solution right. So this is one, one I would say, a simpler uh, use case. The other one that we are looking at uh, right now is the use of uh, AI in robotics uh, for the warehouses uh, and uh, factory floors where robotic arms uh, have uh, now been you know, asked to have perception. So they need to have the right kind of sensors to be able to identify the object, identify the pose of the object, the way it's uh, oriented in a box. And these could be very tiny objects like screws and uh, connectors or nuts. And uh, one of the challenges there that we see is uh, the, the customers want the operation to be really fast and simple because they expect a uh, non-technical person being using, uh, to be using this kind of a system. So they want the operations to be, you know, take one image and then you kind of predict the entire 3D model out of it. Uh, and that's a complex task. So, you know, we get to discuss with the customer and say, okay, I'll take a few images and then I'll you know, try to reconstruct uh, this 3D model and then use the 3D model to create different poses and then uh, start, uh, you know, identifying the right pose. Uh, so this is this is one one very interesting project that we've uh, recently started working on and computer vision is, is the core part of the solution. Yeah, I think most of the things that we do are similar. So. Uh, our areas of usage of computer vision are mainly object detection and image segmentation. So the sub uh, use case within those is uh, prohibitive space, which is basically for employee safety. Uh, we have large paper mill size of football stadiums or a couple of football stadiums, and there are areas where there are forklifts, where there are big cranes who come in, so you're not supposed to enter those areas as an employee. So we had this problem of how do we detect automatically and there are cameras, there are CCTV cameras, but they don't have the intelligence to detect. So that is where we started on, okay, how, what if we give uh, intelligence to cameras and then how do we think about it? What does it take to get us there? And the big part is detecting and then alerting, right? If an employee is there, it needs to alert in real time. So it's all within seconds. We are not in sub-seconds, definitely not, but in uh, sub-sec, but we have to do it in seconds because we have to alarm that employee or a person and there are many ways we implemented that and we found the best one initially starting this again three years ago which was basic stage and then we improved and improved and improved and iterated so that's one uh, major change that we made to the industry and we avoided a lot of uh, harmful incidents to many other things because it's, it's a, at the end of the day paper manufacturing is a chemical process. So we have to be extremely careful on how do we deal with uh, on the floor. The second use case is uh, about quality on the products with, that we manufacture. So uh, the folks who are from manufacturing knows the speed of manufacturing, right? It's everything in seconds, it flows. So one simple use case is how well are we packaging up products, right? Everything is automated, everything is robotic arms they do it and they flow in, in seconds. So giving that camera intelligence to detect any anomaly in the way it is packaged is, is the biggest use case that we have done and we eliminate a lot of uh, wastage in that. So quality and employee uh, safety has been major changes on manufacturing industry. We're still looking at many other things as uh, Pradeep pointed out on maintenance activities. We have uh, boilers and furnaces which are hot and and one of the challenge, again, I'll address in challenges section, is how do you put a camera at an extreme temperature? What cameras do we use? Initially, the cameras were melt. So how do we use it? What do we use it? Uh, the infrastructure has been a critical point. So these are a couple of use cases, quality uh, inspection and employee safety at uh, GP today. And we are looking for more and more on how do we optimize our processes, how we cut the word or how we make paper. So these are the other things that we're trying to do at GP today. Yeah, and uh, what has been most interesting to me in autonomous driving is the way we represent uh, the world. Autonomous driving, as you all know, needs very high fidelity representation of the, of the world in 3D, right? You might need voxel level um, 
understanding of what's out there, what's in front of the vehicle. One of the representation space is bird's eye view, which is more like 2.5D um, and, uh, you know, sensing the world through the eyes of the camera and possibly other sensors like LIDARs and radars and getting all those features, bringing that into like a common coordinate system like bird's eye view uh, is challenging, but at the same time, very exciting. Um, and once you have uh, features from various sensors in that common coordinate system, then you can uh, form, uh, you know, different tasks such as uh, 3D object detection or segmentation or trajectory prediction and so on. Um, and I think transformers have been really effective in doing that. It can take, uh, you know, any, any sensors and make sense of it. Um, and you can bring, uh, you know, you can literally transform uh, perspective view features coming in from camera into like this bird's eye view features. And that is learned end to end. So there are also other ways of doing that. Uh, you could have like uh, pre-mapped, uh, pre-computed maps to do this sort of transformation, which is more a uh, traditional way of doing it. Or you could just have an MLP, take one column of an image and transform that to bird's eye view. So those are some of the architectures um, that have been really helpful in doing uh, this sort of transformation, bringing everything into a cohesive uh, you know, representation space and then performing uh, various tasks on it. Um, so yeah, that has been uh, an, an interesting use case of computer vision. Now, uh, you know, as exciting as computer vision is, obviously there are a lot of challenges and uh, I, I'm sure audience would love, love to hear what are some of the challenges or what are some of the hurdles you've been facing in your industry. So could you all talk about some of the challenges that uh, you know, you've been trying to solve? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think for us in, in medical imaging, a big one, a big challenge is if you're training models based on annotation, right? Is how do you get this annotation? So most applications in computer vision uh, out there are doing things with quote unquote the real world. You, you're trying to detect chairs and, and scooters and, and in your manufacturing. And it's pretty conceivable that you can find a group of people to annotate this for you so you can train your models. Take a bunch of images, send to a group of people and say, help me find where boxes are and put the bounding boxes a cat is. Uh, this is not something you can do with histopathology. I, I get, a, a, you know, a, a, um, a slide from a tumor. I'm a physicist by training. I look at it, I do not know what I'm looking at. And I cannot help the doctors understand which cells are what. In radiology, same thing. In the videos that my team is looking at, is endoscopy videos, ultrasound. Sometimes we can have things that we can explain to a group of people to help uh, annotate the data, but a lot of times you need to, to have this clinical expertise, which is just not easy and not cheap to find. So finding doctors that are able to annotate the data for us is really expensive. So we try to squeeze as much as we can. If you're gonna annotate this data, let me give you 10, 20 different tasks and let me try to find harder images for you to annotate because those are the ones that are gonna be the tricky ones, right? And try to use their time as best as I can. So annotation of the, the data is a big one. And the other that's really, really big and challenging is the biases that the data, data set might come with. So for images, uh, I, I was giving a talk here yesterday and I gave this example of, um, if you're trying to predict if someone with uh, COVID is going to, to pass away, is going to die or not from the chest X-rays, there is a big chance that your model is going to make predictions not based on whether the, you know, the infection, the level of, of COVID in the lung of this person, but it's going to be looking at other things like, is this person in a ventilator or not? Does this person have a, a, a pacemaker or not? And those are biases that are basically, you know, they, they are correlated to the outcome, but they are not causation, right? It's not because you have the ventilator that's gonna cause you to die. But from a computer vision uh, point of view, the images will have those 
or uh, things in them, and it's really hard for you to remove them. And that's one area that we are excited about uh, diffusion models and, and Gen AI, to be able to generate data that's now biasing your data set in a way that you, you're basically removing those biases that are messing up with your model. So uh, yeah, could talk about challenges for days, but those are two big ones. Yeah, I think uh, challenges definitely, uh, I can think of three. Uh, one is, as Pablo mentioned, data. And I think that's a perennial problem for everyone in this space. Um, uh, so when we deal with uh, different kind of applications, the first uh, question that we ask or the customer ask is, OK, where do you get data from? And we have to deal with real world data. Uh, there is, of course, the use of synthetic data that's coming up now. But uh, the variations that you need, uh, you may not get in, you know, the good quality data set that uh, is really required to get a robust solution. So data is definitely a problem. Uh, the second is the compute uh, or the actual deployment platform. Uh, and we do a lot of edge uh, AI based uh, implementation. So we really need to keep the cost of the solution low. And you just can't throw a GPU at every problem. right? Uh, that's the easiest thing that you can do. But that's a prototyping stage where you at least have the proof of concept. But then you need to go and shop around and identify uh, different kind of hardware units, which does as good but at a lower power and lower cost. Some of these applications that we do also have to be battery operated. So you're talking about really low power, low cost devices. So trying to get these models, which are uh, really heavy in terms of memory and compute, down to a form which can run on a hardware is also you know, a bit of a challenge. So that requires optimization experts to come in who understand uh, hardware accelerators, who can program uh, and, and get it down to that level. The third um, problem that we are seeing is deployment. Now, it's easy to develop a algorithm, a POC, and then ship it out to a customer. But that's not the end of the story. Actually, the story starts there. We have to maintain it for many years because uh, you're going to see uh, corner cases that you have not seen in your uh, you know, supervised learning. Uh, so you need to keep on uh, upgrading the system. Uh, and that model up, uh, upgrading has to happen seamlessly. You cannot expect that unit to be shipped back or data to be sent. So you need what we call as in-field trainable systems. Uh, and that is more likely to be cloud enabled. So you are just uh, doing all the data set upload to the cloud retrain and push the model back uh, to the edge device right so that becomes seamless and that's not an easy uh, you know uh, piece of tech to deal with uh, so that's the third third challenge that i can i can think of i think uh, i i echo all those three challenges because we went through that data infrastructure and deployment or ml ops right so this is the technology challenges now get into the functional challenges because we are detecting humans, employees, faces. So we have to have union labor laws to accept some of those deployments in, in, in different states or different laws. And everyone is you know, skeptical about the usage of computer vision because you're being detected. So we have to be very careful on not detecting the face. It's only an in-person detection and not a phase detection. And uh, the other one is the network itself, which is again coming back to technical slash functional is how do you stream so many images or video continuously from a low end bandwidth, which is off the city limits with just megabytes per second internet, right? That is the other challenge and it took a very big change on upgrading the infrastructure at every mill. So as Pradeep mentioned, we have to move from server-based farms to Kubernetes-based farms and then see how do we deploy it faster, how do we make the changes faster. As I said before, speed and scale is very important on how do we do these things. There is, there is nothing called offline because these manufacturing plants are running 24-7. So there's no, I can do it in the night or in the morning or peak hours, less peak hours. No, it's, it's a continuous. Because if I stop paper rolling at the end, I have to stop the whole, whole factory for that. And then it takes days to <laughs> restart everything. So if something is a downtime, it's a great impact to the business. Uh, because many customers depend on what we produce. Uh, so those are a couple of challenges. I again agree with the data, annotations, labeling. This is not easy. The textual data is having some context around it. Image data doesn't have any context around it. You need to annotate, you need to label them. Metadata for images or videos is a major challenge. So again, we wouldn't say we are matured, but we are going through the progress on how we are doing that. And coming to synthetic data, which is the duplicate or uh, simulated data, 
we're trying to use generative AI to use, <laughs> generate those images based on the existing images. But again, it's, it's not perfect, right? You have to make the uh, models understand how the existing images are, go there and then generate the synthetic data. But camera, infrastructure, data, functional on the labor laws and all that stuff, these are all the major challenges and it, it took significant amount of time to get, uh, to overcome the functional challenges versus the technical challenges. So that's about being an enterprise. So you have both sides of the coin. I also completely echo with what Pradeep said um, about deploying being one of the major issues. Um, in autonomous driving, it is one of the biggest challenges. If you look at where state-of-the-art is going in autonomous vehicle perception, there is new state-of-the-art algorithm every single week. If you look at the leaderboard, every week you see a new method that does the best. But at the same time, their computational requirements are exponentially increasing. All of those methods use multiple GPUs that takes hundreds of watts. Um, and even then, they take something like a second to run each frame. You cannot deploy that on, um, on an autonomous vehicle because of both issues. You, you don't have as much power um, available just to consume, um, just to be consumed by the GPU. And at the same time, you cannot afford to not be real time. Uh, so while the algorithms are um, you know, increasing at a really great pace, at the same time, you need a way to be able to deploy that on a low cost, um, you know, low cost, low power hardware accelerators. So then what do you need to do? Like you can either implement uh, really optimized, um, uh, you can implement them in a really optimized way for your hardware accelerators or you could adopt uh, you know, an architecture that can run efficient, very efficiently on those hardwares. Uh, if you look at transformers, they're O of N squared, right? You could uh, adopt LIN transformer, which is something like O of N. Uh, Swin transformer is a great example of that. So yeah, uh, using like, just trying to optimize the algorithm itself and doing optimized implementation of certain layers so that they can run on they can run very efficiently on the hardware accelerator. I think those are uh, two major, um, you know, two ways to tackle this, uh, in my opinion. Um, but I think every new challenge, you know, presents new opportunities. So on that, uh, I would love to understand from you guys if you think there have been any innovation recently that is that you are most excited about, and you think that will unlock um, certain opportunities. Yeah, I think lately I, I'm really glad to be in computer vision right now. I think uh, we had a wave in the beginning, I don't know, maybe five or so years ago where people had all the excitement about, oh, maybe it's possible to do this, maybe it's possible to do that. I think we are moving beyond that to actually productizing, right? And putting in front of, of people and they are getting more and more familiar and used to just having those, those tools there as part of their daily job. Um, in the past year or so, for our team has been the, the growth of those pre-training models, as I mentioned before, where, you know, as a pharma company, you have millions, I think we are the number of 50 million slides of, of different uh, histopathology slides that come from uh, tumors and, and cancer and, and whatnot. And all of those, they show you a little bit of a uh, uh, slide into a different disease and each of them have a little bit of information and you don't want to necessarily just, okay, I'm focused on disease A, take all these slides of disease A and let's use them to try to understand something where perhaps all those slides that you're not using also could have some information. And uh, so what we are doing is processes of pre-training like Dino uh, came out of Google, uh, SimClear came out of Google and I think Meta released Dino and now they have Dino V2. And what they do is you throw a bunch of images in those pre-trainings, right? Where the model doesn't have yet a task of classification task or anything. It's just trying to understand uh, if I take two images or if I take one image and I take two different patches of the, the this image, can the model detect that those two patches are coming from the same image and not from two different images? 
So Dino, for instance, is a great example where you're playing all those different games. You're like taking an image and you're flipping, you're changing color, and you're asking the model harder and harder tasks for you to figure out are those coming from the same image or those two different images. And it's almost, uh, it's still surprising to me, but that you get in the end of this a vector out of an image that has all sorts of good information out of that. It's basically a condensed version of, out of everything that there is in this image, I managed to get a vector of, I don't know, 50 out of a very large image that now this vector has so much information that you can use for cancer predicting, prediction. You can use for uh, predicting if this person has a mutation in their gene. You can uh, use for segmentation algorithms. You're not even touching the, 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 the image anymore. Everyone who has a different use case for a different cancer, for a different application, they are using the same vectors that have been pre-trained in a large GPU. Yes, it takes 10 GPUs running for a week to get those <laughs> vectors, but then you do that once. And then someone comes with a new question, you're just using this vector again and again and again. This has been like orders of magnitude transformative. I think people in several industries have been realizing this and, and we in pharma also realize that this has been super useful for our images, particular videos that are really large. Uh, we now don't work with the videos, the raw videos anymore. We're only working with those vectors of condensed uh, information. So it has been completely transformative. Yeah, I think uh, if you look at the innovation, I would say uh, in the, the four areas of a, of a system that you have, you have the sensors, you have uh, models and algorithms, and then it goes on to a platform, hardware or cloud, and then you have the deployment. I think in all of these areas, we are seeing transformations happening. Uh, we are seeing sensors, new, new type of sensors coming in, uh, 3D sensors, uh, there are a variety of them, time of flight, and there are variations of those, and they're getting cheaper also. So LiDAR for automotive, I think, was seen as prohibitive in terms of cost, but we are seeing options where you find uh, 3D LiDARs which are affordable. Uh, radars are getting cheaper. Uh, there is one that we came across which was just uh, $5 for a radar chip that can be used for simpler use cases. Uh, for example, you don't want to use a camera to detect a person, but you can use a radar to know that there is an, there's a person and use it for your HVAC uh, maintenance, I mean, your control of HVACs, for example. So sensors, definitely there's a lot of innovation that's happening and thanks to the sensor companies for enabling that. And uh, models and algorithms, that's an open source world out there. And I think all of us are benefiting from that. Um, and I think like Ashoka mentioned, every every week or every two days, there is a new, new architecture, new model, there is code, there is data, uh, so much easier than it was uh, years back. So there is a lot of innovation happening there, and thanks to the research companies for that. And on compute, uh, there is, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of variety of options to choose from. You're kind of spoiled for choice in, in one sense. And deployment, like uh, you mentioned about Kubernetes, microservices. So I think there is a lot of interesting innovations that are happening. Gen AI is something that we're looking at, but it's, it's a little early to kind of say, okay, where it's going to really hit the mark. Uh, synthetic data generation, yes, that's uh, one use case. Uh, but yeah, this is what I was thinking. Yeah, I'm, I agree with both of you on, on technology advancements and innovation. So again, coming back to my enterprise background on manufacturing is computer vision is going to change the way we do manufacturing or any other uh, industry per se because it's adding eyes and brain to the machines. And again, it could be a robot, it could be a camera, it could be anything. So. We would develop speed, scale, efficiency, and optimize the way we do things going forward. So again, it's not about innovation, but it's about performance and optimization going forward. As technology advances at this at a different speed, I think businesses are still behind in catching up those technology. What I would advise is catch up with technology so it would define the way you do business in future. Yeah, transformers have been great. <laughs> My bet is on it. Um, it can literally take in any arbitrary data and learn to make sense of it. And that has been uh, really important in not just in NLP, but also in computer vision. In autonomous driving, uh, we have been using transformers to just take in all sensor data, just combine all of them, get the joint representation, and then do certain tasks in it. So that has been one of the transformative innovation, I would say. Um, we are almost, I think we are, we are over time, but in last 30 seconds, very quickly, uh, 
where do you see computer vision going in the future? Where do you think it is headed? Yeah, I think just following this trajectory that we have been seeing of condensing information before you do the pre-training, um, part of me would love, and maybe this will happen, for all those different industries, instead of getting loads and loads and loads of data, and every company has the same data set and is using to train the same algorithms, for this data to just live in one central place and instead you're basically buying those vectorized representations that then you can use for everything. I think this is, is going to happen. I don't know as a data scientist if I will trust. If someone is just saying, here's a vector, go use it. I, I still want to go and, and, and use the data, but I think that is one place where, where we ha we're headed. Uh, I, would, I would think uh, sense of fusion, and I think Shubham kind of alluded to that. Uh, multiple sensors coming in, multimodal, uh, multimodal uh, sense of fusion is an area that we are uh, looking at exploring for different use cases. So cameras with radar, camera with lidar. Uh, there are there are use cases where uh, uh, where cameras were used for uh, uh, surveillance uh, and let's say pedestrian detection. But there are scenarios where cameras don't work because of ambient operating conditions. So they want to have a lidar also added to that. So that brings in additional information available to the system to take some intelligent calls. So I think sense of fusion is something that you know we, we are looking forward to. Yeah, I think it, the computer vision has so much scope going forward, whether it's any, any kind of area, technical, functional, whatnot. Uh, again, coming to all the four aspects, as uh, Pradeep mentioned, all are going at a rapid pace, and they would definitely give a lot of innovations and a lot of new stuff to do. Thank you. Uh, I think we are coming very close to building foundation models in computer vision, very similar to how where we have approached in natural language processing. I think soon enough we'll have models that will have like a model for the world built in, and then you could query certain things. I think NERF is a step in that direction where it understands the object that it is trying to represent, and you could query what's at a certain location, what color is it. Uh, reflecting and so on. So yeah, uh, I think that's where computer vision is headed in general. And with that, I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll thank all the panelists here and thank you to audience for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.